over the next few uh, weeks, we're doing a series of these, uh, these, these streams, these live streams, where we're talking to different people like John, who we'll introduce in a moment. Um, and then on June 30th through to August 6th, we're going to do something a bit more like a conference uh, online. And you can find out more at 2020.devrel.net. Okay, so John Gottfried, thank you very much for, for joining me for this for this uh, stream. Uh, you're uh, one of the founders of Major League Hacking. Um, can you just tell us briefly what MLH is? Absolutely. So Major League Hacking is the global student developer community. So we work with hundreds of universities and a number of high schools as well to help students learn practical tech skills outside of class. So think, you know, mentorship, hackathons, workshops, anything someone needs to go from, you know, theoretical academic knowledge to being able to implement and build technology. And we work with about 100,000 students a year worldwide. Um, so it's uh, definitely a, a pretty exciting group to work with, definitely a lot of energy and interesting things going on. And um, we've been at it now for about seven years. Great. OK, thanks for that. So obviously we're in a time when meeting in person is, well, it's not, it's not happening, you know, uh, all, all those uh, cliches about developer relations and developer communities being uh, a thing of travel have, have been put to one side. And obviously hackathons, I'd say in the main part, and correct me if I'm wrong, are things that happen in person. So what's been happening with all the hackathons that you had planned for this year around the world uh, now that they can't happen in the way that you planned? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because um, for us uh, in the early days of this, right, like think back a couple months now, um, the the signal that we were getting was actually from universities, right, where they had started sending students home. And so there was this very, very quick turnaround from we have events planned next week and travel booked to suddenly everyone has to go home in the next two days. Um, so it was a really rapid transition. Um, we've worked really hard to transition to digital. We definitely had a gap where we had been, you know, figuring out how it would all work, what the scheduling looked like, who would be organizing them, since normally, you know, things are fairly localized. And we've settled into a strategy where we are organizing events every single weekend um, designed to replicate an in-person hackathon experience as much as possible. Um, and what I mean by that is hackathons are as much about the social element as they are about technology, right? It's about networking, meeting people, getting peer feedback and help. And so we've been working really hard to figure out that aspect of it because, you know, historically it hasn't been a huge part of online hackathons, right? It's been more of a solo endeavor. Um, and that's really, you know, the thing that we're trying to figure out and other people are trying to figure out right now is how do you make that like really memorable special experience translate to a digital format and it's incredibly difficult like the tools that are available you know don't yet adequately replicate what people can do in person just of like the serendipity of running into someone interesting so let, let's let's talk about that that the fundamentals of hackathons for a moment or two um now I think there are lots of things that happen in developer relations that happen because Twilio did it or some other well visible program did it and it seems like the right thing to do. So why 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 hackathons? Why bother? I think there's a couple of ways to approach hackathons from a DevRel perspective. Um, the first, and, and this is maybe the most traditional, right, is almost the, the road warrior approach, where your goal is to go to events, meet developers in person, build a connection with them, and through that connection, get them excited about your technology and what they can create with it. You know, I think that's what people think of when they think of how to engage at a hackathon. We, we try to take a little bit more of a holistic approach. Um, it's certainly about getting people excited and using technology, but it's also about 
feedback, right? And it, it's about brand awareness and it's about use cases and content marketing. And I think that a lot of DevRel people are starting to utilize hackathons and really any developer events where they are building something uh, in that way where it's multifaceted, right? Um, you know, it's pretty unlikely that anything anyone builds at a hackathon is going to become your next huge customer. But the people who are building it now have familiarity and hopefully a love of your product that they bring with them into future projects and companies that they work for. And you get to see how they actually work, right? And that is incredibly valuable from a product perspective. It helps you debug your documentation and workflows, and it gives you something to take back to the team and say, here's an interesting use case someone built at a hackathon that's like purely a prototype. Here's how we can translate that into a tutorial or something that you know enterprise customers can relate to. And I think that's becoming a much more common path and something that you know we think about really heavily because for our students, they're not going to be enterprise customers anytime soon, but it's at a volume where they will be the next generation of engineers and tech leaders on the you know three to five year time horizon, which you know, for any company that ha expects to be around that long, right? That's fairly valuable. So that's, that's you know, our perspective on it. So you have several reasons that, that make hackathons worthwhile for, for developer relations programs, but also on the developers taking part, you get to learn new stuff, you get to socialize, as you mentioned earlier. So then let, let's, let's dive into that. I, I want to talk about the the social side and all of the, the the supplemental or what on the surface look like supplemental benefits in a moment. But just the nuts and bolts of how how do you approach running a hackathon when you don't have that in person? You're not just in a room together. Yeah, so you you kind of have to go back to fundamentals a little bit, right? Like you asked you know, what does a attendee get out of a hackathon, right? Like that's sort of what you were getting at. Um, we look at it through a couple of different like fundamental levels. One is there's a feeling of confidence and success that comes from building something and showing it off to other people that is incredibly important. Like we do a lot of work to encourage people to demo regardless of how polished their projects are because it really is a, a special feeling when you show something off to strangers. The second part of it is the core educational skills that you get through the process of building, right? Um, a lot of software engineering is hands-on learning, even when you get a full-time job. And so a hackathon compresses that down and you know forces you to really think through, how do I implement this? Not only like, uh, in a way that will actually work within a short period of time, but also in a way that I understand at my skill level and what are the new things I need to learn to make it work right. You know, like I, for example, used Python for the first time ever at a hackathon many years ago because the library I wanted only existed in Python. And you see a lot of those, um, you know, kind of serendipitous moments where developers find a new technology out of necessity. I think that, you know, when we're talking about the social element, you know, we, for, for college students, right, specifically, this is their social group. You know, some students are really into sports and follow teams around. You know, many technology students are following hackathons or are really involved in their hacker club on campus. And that becomes their support system. It becomes their, you know, collaborators when they're working on side projects or startups. And it becomes the people that they want to hang out with on a weekly basis. And I think that you know, that happened for me when I was going to professional hackathons many years ago as a developer evangelist is a lot of the people I met there not only became collaborators and coworkers, but also really close friends. And that's incredibly important. You know, in terms of how to translate that to a digital format, it's hard. Um, we recently have been using Discord. Um, we previously had used uh, many other platforms. The reason why we've gone to Discord is because uh, the ability to have impromptu voice and video chats that you can really just like jump into or out of very quickly is the best approximation we've found of like 
a random social interaction, right? So maybe there's a channel where people are just talking about ideas and team formation. Maybe there's a channel where people are getting debugging help. Maybe there's a channel that's just like a water cooler hangout. You know, all of those things can, you know, be a really fun novel like experience where you meet a stranger. Um, we've also been using uh, video streaming really, really heavily. I mean, I think that's kind of an obvious one. The thing that's less obvious is we experimented a lot with doing wide streams, like think YouTube or Twitch or Facebook, where people could tune in and watch and found that it wasn't like the level of engagement that we wanted in terms of interpersonal interaction um, because you have a one-to-many relationship. And so we've transitioned recently to doing a lot more stuff over Zoom or similar video chat where people can easily interact with one another, but you still have the controls where if you're doing a workshop, for example, it can be one to many and having the best of both worlds has, has definitely helped. And we're adapting a lot of our, you know, like games and fun activities and team building and mentorship to that format so that people can really like you know, meet the other attendees and meet the mentors and sponsors and have an experience that like is memorable. Um, and we're lucky, right? Because most of the people we work with, and frankly, like most people in general are stuck at home. They're kind of tired of just like doing their normal thing, right? It's a little draining to be on Zoom all day. And so there's a lot of desire to be part of the process of figuring this out. Like developers are really open-minded right now in how do we adapt these formats and how can they actually actively have input in that? And, you know, that's that's been incredibly beneficial for us as we're iterating on this like every single week. So let, let's say you're, um, you're you're I don't know, let, well, are you still running them at weekends or are they happening? all over the, the, the calendar now? It's a good question. So we've actually experimented with both. Um, we've done some events that lasted multiple weeks, some that were during the week and some that were on weekends. We eventually decided to move forward primarily with weekend events because the truth is like people still have school and work. Um, you know, during the week we saw major drops in engagement and certainly a couple of people were working on it at night or, you know, even during the day if they had free time. But I think one of the thing that's really important about hackathons as a format and frankly, like developer conferences too, is that you have everyone in the same place and dedicated time without a lot of distractions. And so doing it over the weekend is the best way to accomplish that, right? Where everyone can set aside one or two days and say, I will be focused on this community and this project for a set period of time. And it's not so amorphous where it's like, oh, I'm putting in one hour this weeknight and someone else is putting in six hours. You know, it's really everyone is there for the same thing for the same span of time. And that has a lot of benefits in how engaged people are, how much interpersonal re interaction there is and things like that. Well, so, can you walk me through then um, the the developer, the participant experience? Because I think that will unveil some of the differences, but also some of the practicalities that you've had to address. So, uh, like, for example, I'm still not sure how, even on a Discord server, how those accidental social interactions take place. I would think they're harder because you don't just bump into someone at the lunch queue or whatever it might be. It's definitely harder. There, there's no question about that. Um, you know, generally how this works is someone will sign up maybe a week or two before the event. Um, they'll get emails leading up to it that talk about how the event is going to work, you know, different developer platforms they can use, educational resources. Uh, when they quote unquote show up for the event, they're essentially joining a Discord server. Um, we have been doing uh, live stream kickoff ceremonies where someone from our team will talk through the format, answer any questions, point people to resources uh, live on Twitch or something like that. And then we'll transition into uh, smaller group facilitated team building exercises. So that could be a Zoom meeting. It could be uh, a Discord voice channel. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but like, 
you don't know anyone at the event, it's a really good way to jump in. And we are facilitating that interaction and saying like, okay, like let's go in a circle. Everyone talk about their idea and their skills and what they want to do, right? And that works quite well. Um, once we've done that, generally people set off to work on their projects. Um, you know, similar to most hackathons, uh, there is a element of like, um, you know, you just are working with your team, right? And those are the main people you interact with. Uh, we try to break that up a little bit with different like trivia questions, uh, raffles, video chats where people can play a game, mentorship sessions, you know, Q and A's with like famous developers. You know, we try to like put all of those elements in because I think it forces people a little bit outside of their like direct group of three to five collaborators. Um, and then, you know, as we get to the end of the event, people are submitting their projects, typically on dev post or something similar. And we will pick a handful of demos to uh, go live on our stream so that people can have that visibility. Because I think that one of the most inspiring things about hackathons is seeing what everyone built and being able to show off what you built and get that real time reaction and feedback. And we're trying to simulate that as much as possible through like Twitch streams. Um, so, you know, it, it's really cool to watch because you get on a video, it's a complete stranger, they're screen sharing their project, but like you're watching the chat and people are like, this is awesome. Have you thought of this feature? Have you done this? How did you do that? And it's a really like live thing. Like it, it's very much, um, interactive in a way I haven't really seen before, at, you know, in, in those types of demos. Um, and so it's, it's been pretty exciting. Uh, and, you know, hopefully people leave and have a good experience and come back again in future. Like we're really trying to split up the events by theme, by who can participate, like high school versus university. Um, we have a blockchain one coming up. And I think that attracts people with different interests and backgrounds and skills. So uh, in, in a real world, or a physical face-to-face -face hackathon, uh, because it's all the real world, isn't it? You can um, you can get a an idea of maybe someone who's a bit more reticent, you know, someone who's a bit quieter, a bit more nervous about taking part and putting themselves forward. How do you how do you look out for people like that and support them in an online event? Honestly, it is harder. I think what we've found so far is that you have to be incredibly proactive about it. Like, especially when you're talking about newbies, you know, people with less experience or maybe they have experience, but haven't done a hackathon before. Um, you have to create really structured ways for them to get involved because before you know a lot of people in a community structure provides like comfort and a path forward. So the team building exercises, for example, are heavily focused on newcomers. You know, if you are someone who has all your friends, you've decided to participate together, you're off to the races, you may not go to that and that's fine. But if you're brand new and don't know anyone, you know, we are actively telling you like, hey, do you not know anyone? Do you need a team? Do you not know what you're working on? Or have you never done a hackathon before? You know, come to this like round table where you can talk about that and we'll like help you pair up. And, you know, our staff are sitting there saying like, wow, like, you know Ruby, she knows JavaScript. You two should work together, right? You have similar interests. Um, and that works really, really well. Uh, and then games and stuff, frankly, help a lot too. Like, it's not all about technology. Like, having those social elements brings people out, especially people who, you know, have not yet built that confidence in themselves to focus, like, like maybe they either they're not interested in or not confident enough to just like really go super deep on like, here's the technology, I'm going to like do this 24 seven. The games really provide an experience where it's like, okay, come to this thing, come meet strangers and play a really fun game online with them. And that builds those relationships that gets people to be comfortable in the future, you know? And I think that, you know, anytime you're talking about community building, you have to kind of force it at the beginning in order for people to get outside their comfort zone and and meet new folks. Um, you know, it really doesn't happen organically, like as much as anyone would like to think. Any event format that's focused on building community needs structure and a bit of a forcing function to get people to branch out. Okay, cool. Sorry, I've got a bit of background noise here that might have picked up, I guess. Um, 
all right. I am interested then in look at it from the other side of the fence, um, even though it's all very communal and so on. But the the motivations and, and participation of someone in a DevRel program who is looking to participate in an online hackathon are, are different to a student participant, for example. So what would you say to people who are looking... Yeah, sorry about the big drill you can hear. What would you say about the um, about the, uh, the 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 practicalities of sponsoring a hackathon or participating when you're a DevRel person? One of the benefits is that you're not bound by physical boundaries. Like I, you know, was a developer evangelist for Twilio for a number of years, and I was on the road quite a bit. And I know that most DevRel organizations have you know, kind of evolved where that's not their only strategy. Um, and it wasn't our only strategy at the time. It was really something I enjoyed and sought out. But I think, you know, one of the things we've seen is you as a DevRel person can allocate a couple of hours a weekend to be on Discord or Slack or Twitch doing a workshop or doing mentorship or, you know, talking to people who are doing projects and, you know, how your API or platform might fit in. And, in some ways, it has allowed for a lot uh, greater reach with less effort. Um, you know, we're seeing similar participation levels to online hackathons that we get in person. You know, we had a 500-person event last weekend. Um, so, you know, the the numbers are good. And, you know, frankly, the expense is much lower because you're not thinking about T&E and the mental expense of flying somewhere. Um, but you get a lot of the same benefits of being able to interact with people and, you know, promote your platform and gather feedback on it and see what they're building. Um, I think the biggest difference is, you know, the best developer evangelists are incredibly like uh, proactive about how they converse with and interact with developers, especially at events where they're staffing a booth, right? Um, you know, if you're sitting behind your booth on your computer, people aren't going to be super comfortable coming up to talk to you. If you're standing there smiling, you know, interacting with people as they come by, you know, it's a much more engaging experience. That looks really different at a in virtual event, right? What it actually means is jumping into random voice chat rooms to ask people how they're doing, introducing yourself, posting in different channels via text saying like, hey, like, here's a solution to this problem, or what are you working on? Do you need help? Um, setting up structured activities like Q&A sessions or workshops where you can actually like walk people through your technology live. Like it feels a little different because you're doing it mostly through like, uh, you know, not face to face, but you get a lot of the same outputs. And I think, you know, the, the other big benefit, frankly, is that like there is a consolidation of events when things go digital, right? Like you don't need all of the different localities doing an event at the same time when everyone from everywhere in the world can log on and do it together. And as a DevRel person, that gives you the ability not to, you know, spread your team out across many events, but rather to say like, okay, we'll do shifts over this one event or I'll be on from these hours. And, you know, that has a lot of practical benefits. And I, I think that, you know, what we're seeing and what we're thinking is that that, format is not going to go away even when people return to in-person events because it is so much more scalable and you know online developer challenges and conferences have existed for a long time but i think they're getting normalized and evolving very quickly to a point that like they are going to be a major part of the ecosystem going forward now 500 people sounds like a a lot to manage the interactions between uh online um when there's a physical space i imagine it's you know that that's easier than the managing those people online but so if you are getting events where you have everyone from around the world who possibly could attend this one rather than just being from a particular city how do and I appreciate you did go into some of the, the, the ways, but how do you manage that so that it's not um, overwhelming? Yeah, so um, <laughs> we actually did an event that was 
So the, the hackathon I'm talking about was one called Hack at Home that we did. We did a previous event a couple of weeks, uh, you know, back called the Local Hack Day, where we had about I don't know, it was, it was thousands of developers from around the world, and it was like a truly global event. And the way that we handled it was uh, with two different strategies. One was we have team members around the world who were on shifts for their local region because you would see activity spike at certain times as different time zones came online. Um, and we actually ended up having to have three different opening ceremonies and three different closing ceremonies for each of the major regions, right? So North America, Europe, APAC. Um, so that was one of the things is kind of like segmenting people based on when they would be online. The other thing is segmenting people based on interest. Um, I think that the bigger you get, the more granular you need to get about like where people can gather. But, you know, it's not just like this is the ideation channel, right? Like maybe you need the mobile idea channel, the web idea channel, the robotics channel, so that people can kind of like self-select and filter down into smaller groups because, you know, you're right. Like it's, it's, if you've ever been in a chat where 2000 people are talking at once, like it's not good, <laughs> you know, like it's not very productive. Um, and so you have to facilitate like uh, people going into smaller self-selected groups. So I was I was about to um, ask uh, Juan in the chat had asked how does having everyone at the same time work together when you're in a global event um, and I didn't so I I asked that question uh, without realizing it was yours Juan so thank you um, all right so you mentioned some technology uh, Zoom Discord um, maybe using Twitch or YouTube Live for example uh, to do perhaps some of the the introductory parts. Uh, is is there any other technology that you found uh, has has made a material difference? Yeah, the other one that we just started using, and I was telling you about this at the beginning uh, before we went live, is a piece of software called Streamyard. Um, now, one of the things to understand about MLH's team is that. Uh, most of us full-time are in New York. We have a, a couple of folks distributed around the world, but then we have maybe 50 or so MLH coaches who are our local, you know, part-time event reps and, you know, developer evangelists essentially. And they're all over the place, like totally global. And one of the early things we were trying to figure out is how do we give them all the ability to, stream and create content at a high quality level without having to have like a super powered PC and expertise in all of these like, frankly, like pretty difficult to learn platforms like OBS, right? And, you know, obviously it's really powerful, it's really popular, but it's also hard um, and it doesn't function well on every computer. So we discovered this piece of software, which I'm going to give a shameless plug for. They're not paying me to do this. I just love it. Uh, it's called StreamYard. Uh, streamyard.com and it is a browser-based live stream production studio and the reason we decided to use that is because we could upload all of our branding assets uh, and share them with our team so that they could all go live invite external callers in through a shareable link and it would look high quality because all of the actual like processing was done on StreamYard servers so even if your local connection was like potato quality, the end user was still seeing something that looked good. And that has made a huge difference in our ability to like scale our content production because we no longer need like one person doing the production and piping it out to everyone. We could just give everyone the login to our, our team and you know uh, they could produce it themselves. So that's definitely made a big difference. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, we, have we have you know registration and sign up software that we've built for our events and we've been evolving that you know to accommodate more digital events one of the things that i'll highlight is uh discord doesn't actually make it that easy to tie a registrant's identity back to their discord handle right like those are really disconnected concepts and so we've been building bots that let you have more interactivity between you registering for the event and you joining the Discord channel so that I can actually know who you are and tailor the experience to you. And I think we're going to see a lot more, you know, things like that where 
companies are building like custom integrations into their platforms or into chat servers or whatever else to, uh, you know, kind of build out like a, a good experience. Um, and, you know, you're already seeing like all of these virtual conference platforms spring up or grow, but I think you're going to see a lot of interesting homebrew solutions too. Yeah, well, Phil mentions in the chat here on the stream, remo.co, which I took a lot look at as well which gives you this concept of virtual tables and you can go from table to table and you join a a chat with those people it, um which at the time that i looked yeah. at it reminded me of animal crossing and then yep. a while back what two weeks ago there was a conference run in animal crossing and the speakers were an, have a, yeah so we're going to be speaking to austin one of the organizers on this uh, i think in two weeks time uh to talk about the experience of running a conference in animal crossing um and That's Juan has given me some <laughs> Yeah, I, I I um I don't have Animal Crossing, so I didn't take part, but yeah. Um uh, Juan's just given me some uh, advice on stopping this awful problem of it of the screen size jumping around. Um but maybe I'll go to to StreamYard <laughs> instead. Um all right, so uh I guess we're coming towards wrapping up really. Um what would you what would be your advice then to um people who are looking longer term um how what's the and I, i'm talking about developer advocates in particular here what's the do you think is the longer in term impact of this pandemic situation we're in now on hackathons but also more generally how we do the in-person stuff Personally, I'm bullish on in-person interactions and events being unreplicatable online. Like, I really don't think it translates one-to-one. -one. And I think eventually, when it's safe to do so, there will continue to be demand for in-person events. Like, I, you know, human beings are just designed that way, right? Like, we really get a lot emotionally and psychologically and intellectually out of in-person interaction. So I don't think that's going away permanently. I do think that, you know, and, and a lot of other very smart people have talked about this, so I'm kind of stealing from them, but like, I think that what is going on right now is an acceleration of a trend that may have already been happening. Um, and what I mean by that is, uh, Obviously, there have been a lot of remote conferences and remote events and general like digital first strategies. This is a forcing function where everyone now has to figure that out over a span of like three to six months. And so I think you're seeing a lot of really creative approaches to how do we engage people digitally as developer relations folks, streaming, content, digital events. Like there's a wide breadth of things. If you look at companies in the space, you know, they're doing a lot of really creative, interesting approaches. And I think it's only going to, to compound as time goes on. And I don't think that's going away. Like I actually think that the companies that are going to thrive in this environment are treating it as an opportunity to, you know, uh, create a strategy that works really well and is a necessity right now but in the future will be a really valuable counterpart to in-person events and interactions. Um, that's definitely how we're treating it. Like I've been saying to a lot of people, we're planning for digital first and hoping that it will be a hybrid. Um, but, you know, I, I think that that's all you can do at this point, right? Like the information is changing day by day. And if you don't look at this as an opportunity, um, you're going to miss out because some companies and some communities are going to emerge from this significantly stronger and broader than they were before. And others are going to struggle really significantly. And, you know, it's just a question of your perspective and how you approach it. So, you know, I, I don't want to like get too prescriptive about how to do it because I actually think the most interesting approaches I've seen are totally out of left field and not things I would have come up with on my own. Uh, such as uh, running conferences in uh, Animal Crossing, I guess. Um, exactly. That's yeah. like perfect. So uh, Phil Leggetter in the chat says that he agrees with what you're saying. Um, he's wondering, though, as in-person 
attendance of conferences has seen a bit of a drop off over the past year or so anyway, is online, is a hybrid strategy viable really? You know, is online going to eat too much into in-person attendance uh, to the point of making it, um, you know, maybe not viable? I think, so I, I, you know, it's an interesting question because it's not really what we've seen. I think that like, at least in the student space, in-person event attendance has been steadily going up year to year. However, I've gone to a number of professional conferences and I think part of the challenge is that events don't necessarily scale very well. You know, the intimate experience that you have at a boutique conference that someone dreamed up is totally different than like a mega conference that's, you know, really established and produced. And my opinion is that that is part of what's leading to a drop in attendance is that people go to these conferences and they don't get out of it what they used to. Um, and it's harder to justify as a result to your boss or your family or anyone else. So my hope and, and you know, what I'm imagining will happen is that I actually think we'll have a return to more boutique regional events because I think people are not going to want to travel as far. I think that people are going to want to stick with their local community that they become really involved with and want to continue supporting and that mega conferences are essentially collapsing under their own weight, right? Like you look at these huge, like hundred thousand person conferences and, you know, somewhere the event organizer is sitting there saying my sponsorship dried up. No one's coming this year. We're going to try a digital first strategy and maybe that will just be our strategy going forward. And I, I think that's very likely to happen. Um, but I think there are a lot of factors in play that will cause conferences not to just disappear. Like, um, it's almost impossible to simulate the experience of like sitting down with someone at a bar or a coffee shop and just like having a heart to heart conversation at a conference. And until someone can figure out how to replicate that digitally, I don't think conferences are going anywhere, even if they do change format. Right. Thanks very much for your time, John. It's been really good talking to you. And, uh, if people want to find out more about Major League Hacking, where, where do they go? Go to mlh.io or mlhacks on Twitter, um, and you can search Major League Hacking. We're, we're pretty easy to find. Um, and I, I'm going to give a quick plug before I go. We're doing a program this summer to help students who have lost their internships or jobs due to COVID. Uh, it's called MLH Fellowship. We're paying them to work on open source projects. Um, we've partnered up with GitHub and Facebook and a bunch of others. So if your company is invested in open source and wants to help a bunch of students, we're still looking for folks to to get involved. So it's a good thing to do and it helps the world. So thank you. Thanks for that, John. Uh, we'll put links in the uh, in the show notes when it goes on YouTube and devrel.net. Um, I just want to do a bit of a pitch as well uh, for DevRelCon Earth 2020. Um uh, which is at 2020.devrel.net. Like I say, we'll be starting on June 30th. The CAFP is still open. Uh, this is a truly global event. Uh, our, our friends from the Tokyo edition will be running uh, broadly Asia pack friendly, uh, time zone friendly uh, sessions. Uh, some of us who are London and Europe based will be doing Europe time zone. And then Tamao and friends in the States will be doing US time zone and well, that part of the world. Um, in general. So, uh, so really looking forward to that. For the CFP, go to 2020.devrel.net. Phil uh, Legata is suggesting we run Devrel Con Earth in Animal Crossing. Uh, I would have to, like I say, buy a copy um, of that game. Uh, so, fellowship.mlh.io, uh, 2020.devrel.net. Thanks again, John. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining. And um, see you again next week. Cheers. Bye.